Thank you. You'll be getting fed up seeing me, I think. Anyway, um, the best place for me perhaps to start with my talk is by describing one of Scotland's most important textiles. It's exported globally to every continent. It has brought Scotland much fame and wealth thanks to its popularity and its instantly recognisable patterns. It's bright, it's got bold colours, it's distinctive designs. It needed a massive supply of madder. It employed hundreds of dyers and it relied on thousands of weavers for its cloth. What textile am I talking about? Would it be tartan? It's Scotland's iconic national trademark. Well, it certainly sounds like it, but no, it isn't tartan. It's this textile. This is turkey red. It's a discharge printed cotton cloth, which is named after the country of origin, although the technique also came from India as well. And about 300 years ago, it was produced in Western Europe. It has this signature bright red color. And this example dates from the late 19th century, so it's about 130 years old. And even if you haven't heard of turkey red before, I'm sure you'll agree that it's strikingly beautiful and it's vibrant, a color that has lasted and aged well. Now, in this very special, wonderful conference that we're all in, we have a representative range of expertise. We have dyers and designers and scientists and conservators and historians. And as you each look at this textile, I want you to apply your expertise to what you can say about its colour and its design. What can you use your specialist knowledge of interest? Is it the practicalities of dyeing? Is it how to discharge print? Is it the chemistry of the colourants? Is it the fastness of the dyes to light and water? Is it the history of trade and export of dyes? Between us, we could say a lot about its colour. And as we try to understand this textile through what we know, we'll inve inevitably ask questions, some that we can answer ourselves, and some that we need others to enlighten us with their knowledge. Here's what I mean. If the dye analysts amongst us use chromatography, we would find that madder and tannins are present. With another technique, X-ray fluorescent spectroscopy, we would find that the blue is a prussiate pigment, that the yellow is lead chromate, that the green is a combination of these two pigments, and that black is prussiate blue printed onto the red. The white areas have no colorant. All these are typical colorants for 19th century printed textiles from Europe. So this turkey red appears to be a good color quality cloth, but like others of its time. But wait, I said it is a cotton textile, and cotton is difficult to dye such a bright red with madder. So there's something special about turkey red, and it is that it is a multiple step dyeing process, not a dye. This lovely color needs the fibers pre-treated with tannin and uniquely with oil before dyeing with madder. A few steps later, involving phosphate and aluminium sulfate and some other dyeing agents and we have the result is this brilliant color but the cloth doesn't look oily and routine dye analysis won't detect the oil but the presence of oil confirms that it is turkey red identifying turkey red is important to know because the makers claimed that their process gave madder superior resistance to light and this implies that museums could exhibit this textile at higher light levels than other madder dyed textiles. So for analysts to detect oil, they need to know to look for it. And a dyer or historian who knew about the turkey red process could tell the analyst this. And then they just need a space or a way of being able to communicate and connect. So my point is that understanding and interpreting the dye history of this textile needs an interdisciplinary exchange of expertise and information. And this will be the approach of many of us here. This is why we are here as bond delegates. 
Interdisciplinary exchange is not always obvious or easy to do, but it is necessary when the dyeing technique is no longer used. And this is the case for Turkey Red. It was once Scotland's biggest textile industry and revenue generator, exported worldwide, including Shanghai. But there is little trace of the production sites in Scotland to remind people about it today. Here is an aerial photograph taken in 1999 of a small town called Blantyre, which is south of Glasgow. This map is of the same place, and it is from 1897, and it shows a madamill and dye works. There's no longer any trace of them. The site is the Monteith Turkey Red Company on the banks of the Clyde, a powerful river stretching 157 kilometers flowing through Glasgow and connecting to another river in the Vale of Leven, another important Turkey Red production site. Until 50 years ago, the Turkey Red Company stretched for miles along the Vale of Leven. And when the last Turkey Red Company closed in 1960 and Scotland stopped making Turkey Red, the buildings were demolished. Now only a few workers with first-hand ex production experience of Turkey Red are still alive. So within one generation, a major Scottish textile industry has been lost. But surviving from this once thriving, visible, and mighty industry are, well, that's, sorry, that's the Monteith um, dye works painted around about 1840, I think. We have some evidence left. These are textiles inside company books. And this is a small selection in the University of Glasgow's Scottish Business Archive, belonging from the Turkey Red, United Turkey Red Company of Lennox Love Bank, which is a town in the Vale of Leven. The National Museums of Scotland in Edinburgh has another 200 sample books of these textiles, and they are this size, each book, enormous. In the Glasgow Archive, we have a calculation book from one of the companies in the United Turkey Red, which was owned by somebody called Alex Alexander Or Ewing, A Andrew Or Ewing rather, A O E. And this book dates from 1873, and it lists the quantities of materials used over a certain period to make Turkey Red. So, here. It might be difficult to see the original writing, but there's an abbreviated form of Madder Roots. The next line down says Naples Roots, and there's also something called Garancine. So the Turkey Madder and Naples Roots have been imported into Scotland, and the Garancine is a natural Madder extract prepared with sulfuric acid. The alizarin is a synthetic dye first introduced or created in 1869. And it's the first mention of alizarin in this ledger by the company. In 2012, Dr. Julie Vert started her heritage science PhD at Glasgow University with me. And she was inspired to research the chemistry of the Turkey Red process. Um, her aim was to understand and identify its historical production, the materials and methods using natural matter and then the change to el synthetic alizarin because of the implications for the conservation to preserve the brilliant color of turkey red. Julie's research centered on laboratory recreation of the turkey red process so she could characterize the materials and, and study the chemical effects of variables by analysis using chromatography, mass spectrometry, and spectroscopy. Dyers in the 18th and 19th century wrote a lot about Europe's turkey red process. Julie wanted to use this information in the university's turkey red archive collection, along with other historical records, to devise one process relevant to Glasgow's producers. It was a challenge because each producer producer had variations and that were closely guarded secrets. This is the back page from the calculation book we saw earlier. And we can see here the circling part is around the words dye house, 
Below it, it says secret house, an old-fashioned term that speaks volumes about the protected traditions of dyeing skill and craft. Experiment experimentation and control is implied in a building called, is it going to work? Oops, it's stopped. My PowerPoint has stopped. Hmm, what's happened? Sorry, anybody help? <laughs> Sorry. It seems to have stopped. Sorry. Go back. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you very much. Um, so, it also mentions the old laboratory, which is rather intriguing. Um, because it implies its experimentation and control. This legacy of complexity and secretiveness still intrigues textile designers and dyers who want to learn about this historical process. So they were very interested in Julie's verification and recreation. And so too, for different reasons, was the principal curator of technology at the National Museums of Scotland, Dr. Klaus Stobermann, who's the co-author of this presentation. Dr. Stelberman was developing the National Museums of Scotland's new art and design galleries in which Turkey Red would feature. He is an advocate of recreating old historical practices to gain first-hand understanding of making and materials and, to, and about the use of tools and technology in 19th century industrial revolution, which is the period when Scotland's Turkey Red industry was most productive. Enthused recreation discussions between us drew out a shared interest to explore well-known as well as forgotten 19th century Scottish manufacturing practices, practices by reconnecting material culture evidence from historical artifacts with science and engineering evidence from historical technology. We could learn much about early industrial processes like textile dyeing from joining up forgotten and lost knowledge through these objects through expertise and practical understanding. For Julie's research, it was important that she confirmed or challenged modern perceptions of how turkey red was made. She needed insight into material properties for its color fastness, the progressiveness of the industry, especially when synthetic dyes replaced madder, and could the archives perhaps unlock some secretive processes that are missing from the published books? I was especially curious to see how cross-disciplinary interactions would influence her thinking. There were other textiles beside Turkey Reds that were, that were large industries in Scotland, and these two have been lost. Carpets made by the Glasgow firm Stoddart Templeton, and the famous Paisley shawls with the distinctive cashmere-influenced pattern designs, which was the inspiration for my logo. These Scottish textiles of the Industrial Revolution became the focus of the reInvent Knowledge Exchange Network that I led with Dr. Stelberman, which was funded by the Scottish Government through the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Our aim was to connect research, researchers and collections to create an inventory of knowledge, literally mapping out the archives and museums with objects, sites of productions and groups and individuals of academic research. Over 12 months, we organized three cross-disciplinary discussion workshops with curators, archivists, and academics. There was also a public event um, at the end to share what we had learned and how, and also to invite local history societies and members of the interested public, like those with family connections to these past industries, to also add their knowledge, exchange, knowledge to this exchange. Inviting people to step beyond their disciplinary norms and share across professional public borders is a novel approach for material culture research, and we didn't know who'd be interested. To our delight, the day-long workshops were quickly and enthusiastically filled by 43 participants who willingly and openly shared and cross-fertilized ideas. Although we didn't intend to create new knowledge, we simply wanted to map what existed we found that reframing and connecting something very familiar to one person as a new concept of piece of information for another was a very effective conduit to answering existing questions and opening up new ones. 
And the examples here are different kinds of textiles that have been very important in Scotland's 19th century textile industry. For example, in our materials workshop, we covered the supply of yarns and fabrics, the techniques for weaving and processing fabrics, and chemicals for preparing, bleaching, dyeing, printing, and finishing, all on an industrial scale. Regardless of how much we already knew, we still asked these key questions. What was available? What was needed? And what production stages were necessary to make or prepare the supplies? We discussed a wide range of textiles. It included carpets, shawls, tweed, tartan, lace, cotton thread, sails, and ropes. The power workshop was really interesting because it gave insight into why the small nation of Scotland was such a prolific producer of high quality dyed textiles. It's this, our national asset. <laughs> I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, this map here shows where the major te textile industries listed down the side were located in the 19th century. The red dots show where they are. We can see that they're centered around the rivers and coasts, especially the River Clyde, which is here. Very long. So, rainfall, our liquid national asset. Not something that residents in Scotland would normally see as a benefit, let's be honest, but the rain provides good quality water in plentiful and powerful supply. It's a perfect combination for turning mill wheels, for powering the machines for textile dyeing and for uh, fibre preparing, and for processing and finishing the cloth. Now, we did take many photographs from the fascinating reInvent workshop, but to be honest, they're actually quite boring because it's just lots of people sitting around <laughs> talking very intently to each other. Um, I'll see if this will work. Um, I'm hoping here that um, there's a little short video I can show you. This was from, um, but I can explain it even if it doesn't work. Um, the tools workshop that we had was at National Museum Scotland. And this loom is displayed in one of the public galleries in the museum. And Dr. Stubberman arranged for Dr. Dan Coglin, the gentleman seated, who's the textile curator at Paisley Museum and also is a weaver by training. He was allowed to operate the equipment as part of the workshop. Let's see if this will work. Yes, I think that's it work. Oops, thank you. Oh, thank you. How do I make it go? No, it's not going to go. Oh, never mind. I'm going to waste time doing it. I'll, if I can come back to it, I'll show you. But Dan works the loom, and you hear it clicking, and you see him as part of this big machine, which, when it's static, doesn't mean much. But as you see the person working the loom, it suddenly makes a whole lot of sense. Um, and it wasn't just the recreators who thought so as well. As Dr. Coglin worked the loom, there was lots of its hypnotic rhythm. It was like a sensory beaker, beacon to the public visitors in the museum. And they appeared alongside us. And museums like, like New Lanark Mills in Scotland and the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester, England, both run their large looms as public demonstrations although this brings up issues about maintenance and replacing parts of equipment that are now obsolete, but that's a discussion for another day. Our public event was a show and tell. We had over 70 people with professional and public expertise who came along with, had a collection of different ob historical objects, and this was perhaps the best picture of reInvent was that I asked for a big cake to get made <laughs> of the logo, which was very tasty. So we had food for thought in every way. So, our network. Our network reInvent unlocked a vast amount of expert knowledge about physical material evidence, but there was one thing missing. The unrecorded, unspoken voice of the dyer and the printer and the designer 
and in this period, the engineer. What were their interactions with their co expert cultures of making and doing and thinking? Where were the boundaries and how were they nav navigated? In other words, how did experts communicate? What were the unspoken or unrecorded intuitive skills? Think of how we learn a new recipe for cooking. There's much information that we already know without needing to follow instructions from a book or from someone, where to buy the ingredients or substitutes, what utensils to use. In essence, there's a lot we, we, don't, we don't need explained to cook this food. And the information we don't need to communicate is called tacit knowledge. It is understood or implied, and it doesn't need stated. It's what we tapped into when we looked at the Turkey Red Textile earlier and thought about what we knew from our own expertise. It was what Julie needed to recreate an historical Turkey Red. The simple act of looking at the same object through the eyes of different expertise is a powerful one. And Dr. Stabman and I wanted to tap into this past tacit knowledge through modern expertise of the same practice. And this led us to the recreate, um, the, it was a follow-on network to reinvent. It was also funded by the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and this time lasted for 18 months. The focus was still 19th century textiles, but this time it was about people, it was about practitioners and innovators, and about their experimentation and cultures of expertise. Through historical material evidence, again, objects and books in museums and archives, and through heritage sites like New Lanark, 16 practicing researchers from academia and heritage organizations contributed the history of textiles, fashion, business, art, design, science, and technology, along with the heritage scientists like myself and Julie, with the curators like Klaus, and with collection care for conservation. Especially important was to include the PhDs and the postdoc researchers, are essentially our apprentices, if you like. In the four themed one-day workshops, we explored historical evidence through each other's perspectives, learning tacit knowledge from each other's expertise. We discussed different design st styles and methods of color production. We talked about materials and methods and laboratory innovation for dyeing and printing, the color to textiles, and the drivers for social, scientific, and economic fashion and innovation. We explored the tacit knowledge of the, hand, of the maker in handmade production. What did they know and do? And who did they need to interact with? And then the change in tacit knowledge from handmade to mechanized production, and how knowledge transferred from one individual to many in a factory. We talked, and we talked, and we talked. And, and the more we talked, the more we created junctions and cross boundaries of disciplinary knowledge. It was fascinating and inspiring to realize that the mechanization of weaving could actually mean poorer design quality, that dyers published their secrets widely and opened in, open in books for the training of the industrial of dyers, that writing down the setting up of a loom looks like pages of mathematics. Like the reInvent, network, we also ran a public event, this time to share our expertise through the interpretation and significance of the historical textile objects, tools, places, and information we had studied. We also organized a PhD and postdoc researchers visit to another city with strong textile heritage like Glasgow, which was Manchester, to visit experts there and see how their collections were researched and interpreted. We learned through practice and practical discussions, and we all took away a very positive and engaging experience. Julie gained a wide network of connections for her research and indeed her career, and learned tacit dyeing skills for her recreation. Importantly, we focused our attention on specific objects of textile production and did what we hoped to enhance our own understanding of objects from different disciplinary perspectives, and importantly, how to ask the right question. Did reinvent and recreate change my, my perspectives? It certainly did. It enlightened and challenged and it improved and deepened my interpretation of my analytical research. And it changed my preconceived ideas about Turkey Red. It was the makers who claimed it was like fast, not the consumers. Was this marketing or was it genuine? For years, the process changed very little. But rather than being old fashioned, 
did it really need to? If it worked, it worked. And the competition between natural and synthetic dyes was less important than the commercial need to recreate the desired fashionable shade that would sell. That is, MADA continued being used right up until the end of the 19th century. So, what came out of the research? Oh, sorry, and this is to show that the, um, the, how my thinking had changed through, through this. I went in thinking it was about the materials, and at the end I came out realizing it was about economics and dyer skills that was the most influential for making that beautiful textile. So, coming into the end of the talk, what came out of our network? Well, Julie did recreate a historical turkey red from an 1880s recipe, and it performed chemically and materially as the historical records said. Perfect, now we could make model samples. So that led to a European-funded project to test the light fastness of turkey red. It was two years, and it's just finished um, a month ago, and it was called Light Faster. And the researcher, Dr. Mohammed Shahid, who is from New Delhi in India, brought his dye expertise to the research. If a variable improved MADA dyeing, one of the questions was, could it improve not only, oh, sorry, if we could understand the light fastness of the turkey red, it would help us with conservation of the color, so the lighting displays in museums. And also, if the turkey red did improve the process, could that improvement be translated into modern matter dyeing? Shahid's experiments proved that the turkey red process certainly did make matter dyeing brighter, but the claim of the manufacturers is questionable. His analysis showed that it did fade quite quickly, but recreating the finishing process involved high amounts of steam and of pressure which you could not recreate in the modern chemistry laboratory and for obvious health and safety reasons as well. So this is another question still to answer. Does that last finishing process actually impart more light fastness? Nevertheless, Shahid's experiments have implications for the length of display time for, for example, the National Museums of Scotland's Turkey Red textiles that are now on display in the gallery because the turkey red perhaps is not as light fast as was claimed. So here is the gallery that um, came out of Klaus's uh, development at National Museum Scotland and on display is the turkey red book which is here in the display. I think I've done it again. Sorry, excuse me. So, Julie's process has passed on in many ways in through public events, including one for textile artists, and it has ended up in an exhibition at the uh, University Archive, which is on at the moment, including our research, and also into textile design. There's been some very good projects in Scotland of um, exchanges between Scottish and Indian dyers, exchanging knowledge again in the spirit of what we've been doing, and the turkey red process became something that uh, the dyers wanted to recreate. So Julie gave dyeing workshops to the textile dyers who was able to tell them about the historical process. The impact and the legacy of textiles in Scotland's history is truly outstanding. And here's a wonderful fact. Scotland has five UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Two of them, 40% of them, are 19th century cotton mills. One is Stanley Mills in Dundee, it's a city north of Edinburgh, and the other is New Lanark, which is south of Glasgow. And these great mills supplied Monteith's at Blantyre, it supplied the United Turkey Red Company in the Vale of Leven, and Scotland's other textile um, dyers and printers with cotton cloth. We have great plans for a visitor, a visitor trail that includes the textile stories that I have told you about today. There is much interest from the heritage sector. However, it is costly business and it's serious amounts of time to scope this amazing trail. And it needs more time and money to generate the funding to take it forward. But I remain optimistic. 
and I know that the enthusiasm and energy from reinvent and recreate is ready and waiting to be reignited. And I hope that one day you too will come and visit us and experience the Scottish textile heritage for yourself with the trail. But in the meantime, please remember that Turkey Red was exported to this part of the world, including Shanghai, and it may well be in the collection here or otherwhere, somewhere else. And I would love nothing more than to know where that is. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.